Last time we met at Waypoint 1, we covered Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. It's talking about the law of Christ, what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. In this afterthought, I was thinking we really should maybe dwell into that whole thing where we need to love our neighbor as ourself a little bit more. What does the Bible say about loving other people? Because as we go into a new year, just a couple days from 2022, we know that things are going to be a lot harder. That we've been dealt now a hand of, quite frankly, judgment that we're not going to get out of. God has told us that we'll deal with some tribulations, but if we just persevere to the end, we'll be saved. We don't know when that that day is coming, but we know one thing's for sure, that the law of God doesn't change. And so if we continue to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself, then we'll be, we'll be okay. We'll be doing what God has asked us to do anyway. And now the story here in chapter 12 is listed in several other of the books. The Gospel of Matthew has it, and so does Luke. And I want to touch on the Luke, the, on the version that Dr. Luke writes in the book of Luke. We'll find that located in Luke chapter 10. Now, interestingly, this it's the same scenario. Jesus comes to a scribe. A scribe asks him a question about what's the most important commandment, and Jesus answers it. Now, it doesn't seem to fit in the timeline as Mark and, <clears throat> as Mark and Matthew do, which would lead one to believe that maybe it's not the same situation, but quite frankly, it doesn't matter. The question is the same. Coming from a scribe, the scribes were attorneys. They were lawyers. Their whole job was to understand inside and out the law of God and to interpret it for the, 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 the leaders and the people who came to them asking questions about the law. That's what their whole life was about. And so is it any wonder that if a scribe came to Jesus who is speaking through possibly the law of God and whatever else that the only thing on their mind would be, do I have it figured out? Do I know the law of God? Do I understand what it means? What can I ask you? So quite frankly, whether this is the same, whether this is the same story or a different story, it doesn't matter because it's written for us in Luke because Jesus wanted us to know through the Holy Spirit what his answer was. What was the most important of the commandments? And so Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. That's Jesus saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Well, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, You shall love your God, Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. That is to say, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, then you can you can get eternal life because you had because that what that means is you would have accepted Jesus as your savior because the bible tells us to that's what it means to love god with all your heart soul mind and strength to love god means to love his son whom he sent and to love people <clears throat> we, re we we read in the gospel the gospels of john that we need to love each other and 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 we know that that Jesus told us that we would know, people know that we belong to Jesus by the way that we love each other. So this is very specific. These two rules hang the entire law because if you take everything that was ever said by God and by Jesus and you put it all together into two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, are it completely and perfectly sums it up. And so that's what he says. What's your writing? What's your interpretation of the law? Well, my interpretation is to love God and to love my neighbor. And Jesus says, well, that's right. That's right. If you do that, if you do those things in the way that the Bible asks, then you will have eternal life. Verse 27. And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. 
And Jesus answered, you have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This, this attorney, this lawyer, this uh, scribe, wanted to make sure that he was doing what the Bible says to do, to love your neighbor and to love God. He probably didn't have any questions about whether he was loving God, right? He was following the law. That's what his whole job was, to interpret the law and follow it. But loving your neighbor is a little bit different. And so to justify or to figure out whether he was loving his neighbor as Jesus had commanded him to, he asked for clarification. And Jesus brings to him a story, a, a parable. Verse 29, uh, verse 30. And then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by a chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samarian, a Samaritan, and uh, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him into an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever, your, whatever more you spend uh, when I come again, I will repay you. And so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And so Jesus tells this story. Now, interestingly, he never mentions that it's a parable. He doesn't say that the kingdom of God is like this person or that person. And interestingly, as I'm sitting here reading this, I noticed that it talks about a certain man went down to Jerusalem. That means it's not just some man, it's a certain man, a man with a name. It's a man that he's thinking of in his mind. You see that further down, a certain priest came by. No doubt, if the priest, the certain priest heard him tell this story, he would know for a fact it was in himself. Because a certain man, a certain priest who has a name and identity must have done this, and Jesus knows about it. And a certain Samaritan, not named, but a man who truly did this very deed. So whether Jesus is telling a true story or a parable, I'm going to lean towards a true story because of the way that Jesus had worded his very carefully scripted story here. But what do we see? We see a Jew who goes down towards Jericho. He leaves Jerusalem and goes to Jericho and, he, and he's, he's robbed. He's mugged by a number of people who beat him up and take all his stuff and they leave him there wounded. He's laying there in the street. But the man is a Jew, another Jew, a Jewish priest, a church leader walks by, sees him laying there, has no compassion for him, and even changes the side of the street he's walking on so that he can continue on past. Now, no doubt, trying to clean up a man who got beat up probably has blood on him. Blood makes you defiled. You defiled. He can't go to the... I'm making up excuses. This isn't, these aren't the excuses that God has. He certainly cared that you loved people more often than the, than the sacrifices you were making for him, right? He wants you to love people as you love yourself. But the priest fails. A, a, a Levite who's a priestly person. Here's a person who may not be in the in in the religious leadership, but he still should have a heart for God, a man who who was called in the Levite priesthood to believe and to love God. These people are could be pastors, they could be lay leaders, they could be ministry leaders, they could be whatever it is, and he walks by too, not caring about the man, his own brother laying in the street. And so what do we see? A man, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, 
came where he was, and when he saw me, had compassion. Now, we need to understand something about Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans had it out for each other. They hated each other, and here's why. Because after the ten tribes of Judah, of Israel were captured by Assyria, they were drawn away because of God's judgment, Assyria allowed other nations to come back and fill the land. Around that area of Samaria, Samaria was the capital city of Israel, of the Israeli tribes of the north, well, you had all of these Jewish people living with all these other nations, and they were marrying and having kids. And so the Jews of Judah felt that they were half-breed Jews. They weren't pure blood, because the Bible says don't marry anybody else but Jews. Um, but that's what they did in the midst of all of that, of that issue. That's why the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, was scorned the way she was other than by Jesus, because she, because Jesus understood that loving people was the heart of ministry. So this Samaritan who has, should not like or should not care for or should not have compassion on the Jews because they hated each other in a racial tension that went on for decades, if not centuries, he has compassion on a man laying half-naked, injured, and almost dead in the, in the street. And so he takes care of him. He, he goes and he bandages his wounds. He pours oil and wine on him on his injuries to soothe the pain and he puts him on his and he brings it back to a, a the inn and he pays two days wages to the innkeeper and says just just take care of him until he's better and then if there's anything past that I'll come back and I'll and I'll pay up with you that was the that was the pain that was that was the beautiful uh, job that this samaritan does a samaritan the, this is this is loving your neighbor and so then Jesus poses the question, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? And he says, well, the, the Samaritan was, uh, of, the, of the, the, the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan. It was the Samaritan. The Samaritan cared for the Jew, even though the racial tensions allowed them not to feel that way. Well, Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go do the right thing. Go love people. It doesn't matter who they are. And I'll tell you that in, in my career, in the last years of my career, when Jesus really took a hold of me and I was baptized and I came to find the, and understand the Lord, the Holy Spirit led me to start looking into and loving people that other people didn't want to touch. Alcoholics, drug addicts. Um, single moms, people on welfare, vets, mentally ill, those people that I came into contact every day, people that didn't want that don't want to help, they want they want to blame the government for not handling it but not getting involved in themselves. I started to learn that these people were loved by God just as much as he loved me, and I needed to do the same because loving my neighbor as myself means loving people. He says, Who is the neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And the neighbor is everyone. Everyone who breathes. So when we find Jesus speaking more about these kinds of things, loving people, whether they're the ones that you love, your friends and neighbors and your family member, or those that you hate, Jesus sees no difference in those people. When you're in the, when you're in the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus speaks to the contrary of loving just people you care for. Look what it says in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the, just, the, rain on the just and the unjust alike. For if you love those who love you, what reward of you? Do you do not even the tax collectors do the same? <clears throat> and if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is saying, it was said of old, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Love your own people, hate the other nations. <clears throat> and that's not necessarily a 
true statement as much as it's a statement that was that was kind of implied by some of the laws and rules that Jesus that God had made in the Old Testament. But he said, make sure you love these people who curse you and they do bad things for you. Pray for them. Pray for their soul. You may win them. They may come to understand. You may, in another place, heap hot coals on their head. That, that is to make them feel somewhat guilty for why they're treating you the way they're treating because you're treating them in a different way. A loving way, even when they spite, you know, they despite you. Or they despise you, they treat you bad, and they persecute you. It's really hard to beat someone who, even though you bring your worst against them, they still turn around and are okay. They're nice to you. It's really hard to do that. And when you start to do that, their, their guard starts to fall. And it starts to come down. And you start to find out that they're that way because of things that have happened in their past or problems they had been having in their present day. And when they see people who truly carry the love of Christ and the compassion, it starts to melt the inside and the spirit can start to convict and work. I have several people that I dealt with in times on the street who started out one way and because I had showed kindness to them, they had changed and the Holy Spirit had got in and started to work on them. And now they're friends of mine. Incredible story. So love your enemies as yourself. This is the same point that Jesus is making in the story. That Samaria, that the Samaritans were enemies of the Jews and vice versa. But the, the story had to be powerfully because it wouldn't have made any sense if a Jew came and helped another Jew. That's what he's saying. In Matthew, he's saying, what, what good is that? We all do that. Step out to do the things that other people aren't doing. Step out to love the people that other people aren't loving. Look into those who are hurting, those who are poor and homeless, have mental illness, who are drunk, have drugs and and and. And chemical dependencies, those who are single moms and on welfare, and those who, man, there's so many people who need help, who need Christ's love. And I promise you, if you get involved in those people, you will start to melt that exterior, that wall around them that they have built up because of their hurt and their pain. They may snap at you, they may try to eat the bite the hand that feeds them, but in time, the Spirit will melt the rocks and remove the little stones. Ezekiel tells us that he will, he will take out that, rock, that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh and bring the Holy Spirit. And that is truly a work of the Spirit and a work of healing that you can have a, a, a direct happening to, a direct um, opportunity to be a part of. I have seen it. I have seen it miraculously. I have seen it. Well, where does Paul want us to go with this? If, if, if we want to love our neighbors and we want to love our, our enemies and we want to love all these people, well, then how does this all manifest in a, in, a, in a quick little list of things that we could be as Christians so that we could love our neighbor as ourselves and love our kids? Well, Paul writing in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, tells us that the, the heading here is, says, behave like a Christian. This is what we're supposed to be. Now, many Christians have come in with a hypocritical spirit, with a, with a, with a condemning spirit, a finger-pointing spirit. And what that does is, is it gives, it gives the, the people that they're talking to, the people that we don't want to touch, the people who need them help the most, the enemies and the difficulties and the Samaritans and all these people, it gives all of them a, 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 an opportunity to say, why would I want to be like that? I, I need help. He's not helping me. He's just condemning me. That's not the way of handling it. Paul does a beautiful job in chapter 12, verse 9, uh, through about verse 21 of telling us what we really need to be. Look what it says. Let love be without hypocrisy. That is, love people all the same and don't love someone in, in an outwardly way, but then hate them on the inside or vice versa. You need to act like you really care about them, not just to to bring lip service, not to just think you're doing something for God. God knows our heart. So love people and really mean it. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, push the evil away and bring what's good and live on those promises. We read, we read that at the end of 
uh, Philippians. Look what it says. Look, look what it says at the end of Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good rapport, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying, hang on to what is good. Take the things, think about, dwell on the things that are good and holy and mighty and, and loving, virtuous, and righteous. Do the things that I was doing and you're going to be okay. The peace of God will rest with you. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Hey, see yourself a little bit less than you see other people. Put people higher than yourself and give them the, give them the place of, of honor in, in there. That's what something. Philippians chapter 2 tells us something like that. Philippians chapter 2, he's talking about a, a, a humble spirit. This is what he says. Paul says, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others higher or better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. See, the Bible is alive with how we want to love other people, how we want to move on, how we want to see them, see our enemies, see our neighbors, see our loved ones, and truly see them through a lens that Jesus would see them. Because we're looking to be more and more like Christ every day. So 10 says, uh, verse 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Just, hey, be in prayer, be, be seeking the Lord all the time, look after those who are in need. These are things we need to continue to do. If we can bring inside our heart the right way of behaving towards the people that God loves and Jesus died for, then we will be on that same plane and we will understand why they're so, uh, why they're so loved by God and why we need to love them that way too. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Hey, don't, don't turn around and take it out on them. Bless them. And as we talked about, melt that heart of stone inside them and bring them to an understanding. When we talked about that conduit of it, God gives you the love of Christ and you understand God's love for you. And instead of hoarding it and holding it, you press it on to people who are in your way by doing a, being a hose of the love of God being pressed through you to others. And they, they receive that love through you. And because of that, they see God and they seek the love of God and they're saved. That is the truth about the gospel. That's what we need to be doing, to be disciples, to make disciples, and to love our neighbor as our self. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. We need to get in people's lives and we need to walk alongside them. If they're hurting, let's hurt with them. If they're rejoicing, let's rejoice with them. Let's not, um, and let's have a uh, mind on, don't set your mind on high things or really important things, but associate with the, the low things, the people at the bottom. Associate with the humble things so that you can reach people at their level. Pressing on past people into bigger and higher things just doesn't, it just doesn't work. That doesn't work because that puts us into a prideful place of looking down on people. And I promise you, everyone on their knees looking up at the cross at Jesus hanging there, there's no one who's higher than anybody else in this kingdom. No one. 
And we ought to see people as equals. God died, Jesus died for all of them. He loves every one of them and he cares that everyone would come to repentance. Do not set your high on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinions. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 through 6 tells us, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings in every way you acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Don't think about your own thoughts, but use God's thoughts to direct your path. And it's the same with loving people. God will show you how to love people. I promise you, he's shown it to me. And when I listen to him and I follow him and I do the things that, that are quaking in my mind, giving money to people on the corner and whatever else, boy, it is, boy, it is that, is that awesome. And that's an amazing time to love our neighbors as ourselves. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all Men he says, look, don't don't take uh, don't pay re evil for evil. If you've done something, somebody's done something to you, don't turn around and do a, a one up them and give it back to them. That's not how God tells us that vengeance is His alone. Because when we go against them, we'll take it higher because we are flesh and we're sinful. God will dole out the punishment needed exactly at the right level. You don't pay evil for evil. Let God take care of it. You be a humble servant in their mind. And what are we taught? We're supposed to pray for them when they come against us and persecute us and revile us and call us all kinds of names. That's what Jesus wanted us to do. That's what he told us to do back in Matthew chapter 5. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For it is for in so doing, you will heap coals of hot, uh, you will coals of fire on his head. And, and and what this means is, this was an idiom. The, the 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 point that's being made here is this: one of the most important things you could have in this in this culture was was a burning stove, a fire, because you could cook your food and you could heat your home and you could do all those things. Well, if your coals went out. You were in trouble because you couldn't start a fire again. You had no way to do that. And so you needed to go to your neighbor and ask for some hot coals. Well, they had a, a tray, like a metal box. Put it on your head, put the coals on there, and then you would transport them back to your house. And so he says, look, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. And by doing so, you're giving over things of value to someone who may not deserve it. And this will lead someone, this may lead someone to feeling pretty, pretty conscientious about the fact that they had treated you poorly, but you treated them with love and respect. And maybe that changes. Maybe that gives the heart, maybe that gives a foothold for the spirit to get in there, convict and change a man's life. I've, I've seen it. I've watched it happen. Verse 21 is, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul has great words here in this section. Romans 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 9 through 21 is an incredibly perfect picture of what we should be doing in these last days. And as we go into this new year, when only things are only going to get harder, government overreach is going to get harder, the mandates and, and all this is going to get harder, people's division and hate and lawlessness and, and, and violence towards one another is going to get harder. And as we find ourselves in a place and an opportunity to maybe save souls and bring them to Jesus and take them with us in the rapture, we have to live a certain way or the hypocritical spirit will then get involved and people won't want to be around us. They won't want to know. They won't want to know know us. They won't want to be where we don't. They won't understand the love of Christ because the love of Christ, the love of God is perfect. We're not. And so we have to be ambassadors to the best of our abilities and loving people without hypocrisy and loving people who are in need and loving people who don't like us, but we like them are great ways for us to do that. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. And when he tells this story of a certain Samaritan who went to take care of a certain Jew who was in need, that's the picture that Jesus is painting. And when the scribe sees it and says, yep, 
I get it. I understand it. I see the answer because it was the one who gave and showed mercy to his neighbor. He said, go and do likewise. And our charge is to go and do likewise. To love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and spirit by the way that we 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 love God and the way that we um, we read and praise and worship. But to love na- our neighbor as ourselves, and that means to love all people because everyone was made in the image of God and they're all loved by God. Jesus died for them all. In that way, it gives us an opportunity to love God just the same and to love our neighbor as ourself. Have a great New Year's, a safe New Year's, and I'll see you in 2022. I love you.